want to represent the head recruiter for 9-11? Mohamedou Old Slahi, the Mauritanian held in Guantanamo. He recruited the guys who flew your friend's plane into the South Tower. I'm going to make him pay. The U.S. government is holding upwards of 700 prisoners in Guantanamo. Since when did we start locking people up without a trial in this country? The prosecution won't show us the evidence they have against you. It's all redacted. You got a problem? Take it up with the government. All my time here, I've been told you are guilty. Not for something that I have done, but because of suspicions and associations. I am innocent. He has been interrogated. He has been held against his will for six years without a single charge being laid against him. Where I'm from, in Mauritania, we know not to trust the police. But never did I believe that the United States of America would use fear and terror to control me. I've never been part of a conspiracy, but I'm starting to think this is what it must feel like to be on the outside. You know, I think I figured out why they built Guantanamo down there. Hello, everyone, and good afternoon, Adam. Hey, good afternoon, Richard. So Adam, we're going to talk about this film, The Mauritanian. It's, uh, it's out on Amazon now. It was in theatres, I think, from April 1st onwards. And it's about Mohamedou Old Salahi. Why don't you give a bit of a background, if that's okay, if you think this is the best way to proceed, into who Salahi is, and then we'll talk about this latest film about him. Yeah, Mohamedou Old Salahi is a um, Mauritanian citizen. He uh, had entered the Afghanistan war while living in Germany. He had moved to Germany because he had won a scholarship, I believe it was a scholarship. He went to um, a university in Germany. And so I think it was an engineering degree. So he, while he was living there, he uh, basically was um, having uh, guests over and they were talking about the Soviet invasion into Afghanistan, how communism is basically infiltrating the government of Afghanistan. And so when the Soviets retreated out of the country, the Najibullah government took over and they were a socialist government themselves, communist backed. And so the Afghans were fighting them. And so Slahi, who didn't want to leave his home, actually went and trained at a, a camp there. But what, what he didn't realize was that the camp was an Al-Qaeda camp. It was called um, al Farouk. But afterwards he had, he had swore bayat, which is loyalty, to Al-Qaeda while fighting against the Najibullah government. He didn't last long. Uh, didn't, uh, he went back to Germany. And then he came back for, I think, three more months. And that was when, I think that was 1992, I want to say. And that was when he disassociated all, any, any association with Al-Qaeda. I guess basically that was because Al-Qaeda was just about forming a political ideology themselves, because at first Al-Qaeda was not a terrorist organization. They were just beginning to train other Arabs against the uh, communist back government. But around that time, that's when al-Swahadi and uh, Imam al-Sayyid al-Sharif, all these Egyptians came and they manipulated the group into a, a very prototype terrorist organization that wanted to fight against the United States and, and Israel. I thought the documentary and, did this well, was showing young Muslim men sat around in a flat in Germany watching news, watching what's going yeah. on in Afghanistan. And because, because to us watching it or, or trying to understand this, it's very hard to understand why you would go and fight in Afghanistan for an Al Qaeda associated group. Right. But when you see their perspective on it, that the, the men, women, and children in Afghanistan are being abused by these godless communists and the country's going to fall to this, you can see why they would feel they have a moral obligation to stand by their Muslim brothers and sisters and, and make this arduous trek over there. So in one scene, it very concisely displayed that to the audience very well, in a similar way to the way the documentaries following um, the a Hamburg cell yes. did so, showing how the, the, the radicalization that they went through over the American uh, sanctions in Iraq, killing half a million children and that kind of process. So I thought it was, it was a good way of like getting you in there. So anyway, the nineties roll along then and, and Salahi, I don't know if there's anything consequential in that period, but ultimately he has a meeting up with some of the future nine 11 hijackers. So anything you want to say about that period then, and then the ominous meeting. Yeah, right. He actually met Ramsey Ben Al-Shibu stood over for one night 
And, and they covered that in the film, The Moritarian, too. Uh, I like how they covered Quick that. Quick question on that, Adam. Did, yes, I read that there were two other hijackers, two other future hijackers who stayed over with Ramzi Ben Al Alshahi. There's three of them there. Is that the case? I believe it was Marwan Al Shahi, and that's what they they allege. But he claim, but Sly also claims that it was only Ben Al Shahi because everything else he said was a lie. Basically, it was only Ben Al Shahi. But right. the, the the government story was that Marwan Al Shahi. That's what that's what the government alleged, but they couldn't prove it. Right, because that 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 came from Bin Al Sheib, but Bin Al Sheib was tortured, so he was saying yeah. anything just like Sly was saying. Uh, so what you've got from the government's from the government's perspective here is you've got a guy who's been in Al Qaeda training camps, and then he's meeting up with Ramzi Bin Al Sheib, who does he's the one that doesn't get the the visa to go to the United States, otherwise he would have been on one of the planes. So he's a coordinator, maybe other hijackers too. So that's two connections and then there's a third one with phone calls he receives from osama bin laden's satellite phone can you explain yes. about that yes bin laden's satellite phone which was being monitored i covered this as of as of late extensively about the nsa um having a, a tap on bin laden's satellite phone that satellite phone actually came from uh ziad al khalil who bought it from a new a long island new york storefront it's an Immersat satellite phone. It went to Virginia, and then it went to Tora Bora, where Bin Laden was, was using it. How the NSA got to monitor that phone was because the FBI was running a separate operation on Ziad Khalil about his claims with the Hamas. Then that phone, uh, they asked the NSA to track that phone. That phone was huge, I think, for a couple of, you know, for I think six years. It was 19, it, he ditched it in 98, I believe. Ni 1998 was when he, he got ditched it after the cruise missiles rained down upon the camp. Right. 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 And this is, there was a whole story that he ditched it because I can't remember which newspaper it was, but it was one of the big Washington, American newspapers. Washington Post. Right. Yeah. I couldn't remember. It was the Times or the Post. They published that he had a phone. Right. right. So then that the, the security establishment put out the, the idea that, that that's why, because the media leaked this. But it was also just like the day after the cruise missiles had come raining down his head. So obviously you think, well, how did they know I was here? <laughs> oh, yeah. Maybe this thing. <laughs> yeah. Ray, right. Exactly. The thing was, was that. Mohamedou Ould Slahi's cousin, Mahfouz Ould Slahi, who's actually on the Shura Council of Al-Qaeda, um, called Mohamedou on the satellite phone. And because of that, that call, which basically asked uh, Mohamedou to send $4,000 to his family in Mauritania, because of that phone call, they, the government had tried to uh, link Mohamedou to a terrorist. They, they said that they used that money for terrorism which I don't know how they, they connected that to terrorism. But anyway, they tried to use that on him in the, um, the briefings that they had for him. And the briefings first were conducted by the FBI. And then, you know, Sly didn't give them what they wanted and the military took over. And that's when the torture sessions happened. Well, there's one more thing I'd like to bring up there. And again, just looking at it from the government's perspective, why this guy might be a person of interest. He makes a trip to Canada just prior to the year 2000, doesn't he? And he's, yes, he's, that's right. Um, that's now, he, he's one of these people that knows the Quran by heart. You can remind me of the word for that in a moment. Uh, but he, he was preaching in a mosque, and it was the mosque that was attended by the fellow who then got caught going south of the Canadian border with a car full of explosives for the Millennium Plot. Do you want to just flesh that out a bit, please? Yeah, the uh, word for the Quran memorization is the Hafiz. And yes, he actually was linked to Ahmed Rassam. Ahmed Rassam is actually the one of the part of the multi-layered operation about the Millennium Plot. And what Rassam was trying to do was try to bring a car full of explosives into the United States by using a British Columbia port. And it was only because, by the grace of good luck, but that one security guard, she basically looked in the trunk of the car and underneath the, I think the spare tire was this huge amount of, of explosives hidden in the tire well. And he basically ran away and they caught him. And th that's how they tried to connect Sly because he was also in Canada at the time. Yeah, he's questioned about that. He's questioned and released because he's not, there's no direct connection between these two men, other than that they're in the same mosque. But right. would, right. this is basically where the film starts at, after 9-11 with Sahali being picked up in Mauritania by the police there and handed over to the Americans. Now, would you agree with me at this point that it seems reasonable this is someone you want to maybe talk to, given he's got an historical connection of Al-Qaeda, he's received phone calls from the Laden satellite phone, there's financial transfers going back and forth, he knows, has had a, one of the 
primary instigator of the attack staying in his apartment. And there's this connection, which may not be a lot in and of itself, but when you combine it with everything else, this connection to a terrorist attack coming out of Canada. So would you agree with me that it does seem like, yeah, we'd want to have a chat with this guy at least. This is a person of interest. Oh, yes. I, this is something I, when I watched the film, I agreed with, that uh, he would be a person of interest. I think the, 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 the strong link here is his cousin, Mahfouz. He actually is a high-ranking member of the Shura Council of Al-Qaeda. However, at the same point, Mahfouz later condemned bin Laden and Al-Qaeda about the upcoming terrorist attack. They knew about it. That they, and they disassociated themselves from Al-Qaeda and said they wanted nothing to do with it. And yeah. Mahfouz actually left. And he went to Iran to relocate because the United States invaded Afghanistan. They were looking for him. And he, they found out that he had nothing to do with uh, bin Laden or al-Qaeda during the... Um, uh, he, the he knew that 9-11 was coming in advance, didn't he? Yes, he Sorry's did. cousin, because he, he disavowed right. it a couple of months in advance. Right, yes. Then we get to the part where, where the film starts, okay, where he's picked up by the Mauritanian police, handed over to the Americans. And that's where things take an ugly turn because this coincides with initially it's an fbi interrogation going on fairly standard stuff but he's extradited um i don't know if it does he go to a, a black site prison around the world first but he ends up in guantamo bay and at some point the fbi withdrawn and the cia come in then we start to get these extraordinary tactics being used yeah the more actually more Italian officials actually detained him he wasn't arrested he was actually coming in to talk and then i think he was um that's where they brought him to the station and he was questioned by the FBI because at that point, the FBI was basically trying to talk with anyone who, where the information was coming out. Cause what a lot of people don't understand is that after 9-11 happened, all this, it was a, a tidal, a tsunami of information, cables from all around the world were coming in, you know, as usual, you know, all this information comes after the event has already happened, not before. But all this information comes in. It's overwhelming. It comes into every CIA, FBI, NSA station, and it all comes in. The FBI actually goes to Mauritania, and they pressure the Mauritanian government to detain Mohamedou Old Slahi because of his connection to Mahfouz. So they bring him in, and he's questioned for seven days. However, what Old Slahi doesn't know, what doesn't realize, is that um, by September 13th through the 15th, Bush under the pressure of the Central Intelligence Agency, was uh, giving a more expansive leeway to the rendition program. And at the same time, about, I think, a week or two later, the torture program was started to be implemented, and it came to White House counsel, most notably John Yu. So here we are, Slahi's at the station for, I think it was a week. Yeah, he's exhausted at this point, but they're not torturing him. So he's under intense pressure to try and talk, but they think he has more. And so the FBI is not getting nothing out of him. And so they leave and the CIA takes over. And when the CIA takes over, it's with the U.S. military involved as well, because they open up a detention program in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. And now instead of uh, an army base there, they built a prison fortress, uh, which was already there. It's now converted into a uh, detention program for high-valued detainees. So President Bush, when Sly was being interrogated, Bush actually made an entire list, a huge list for the CIA to go and detain all these people that the CIA thinks were involved with 9-11 or had in some way some association with the terrorist attacks. Also at the same time, they also had a very covert list. It was called a kill list. And they were to kill certain people on this list, not to capture them, but to kill them. And bin Laden was on that list. You would think that they want to capture him and put him on the stand or whatever. But Sly goes. Um, he's actually transferred to um, Camp 7 or Camp Delta, one of those camps. Uh, it's a black site. And he's given ID number 760, which was in the film. They actually used the real number. And so he gets there, and he is just brutally tortured and the film did a really good job of putting like a big emphasis on how he was tortured i have the book he went through a heck of a lot more than that they left out the more brutal parts but they you know they put in a lot there and i was surprised that they 
you know, they showed the sexual humiliation of him, that he was chained to the floor. He was chained from his neck down to his wrist and to the, to the ground. It was just an enormous amount, but it went to, what the film was trying to show the gravity, the enormity of the depravity of these people mm. to get these people to talk. And that was the whole essence of the case. Um, I, I so thought the film was amazing like that. I mean, the thing that yes. broke him in the film was they threatened to have his mother brought over, detained yes. and raped. Yeah. So, and that's what got him to ultimately confess, make a false confession. Here's what I'd say about the film, Adam. I've never, I don't think, seen a film that was so critical of, the US military and the CIA on a structural mm. level. Okay. So you have films like A Few Good Men. Who was in that? Was it Jack Nicholson? Yes. Tom he was the general. Yeah. Uh, where things get out of hand uh, with the US Marines and a Marine is killed, accidentally killed as part of like a hazing process. But that film has a kind of resolution where this is exposed. Okay. So what mm. the message is things can get out of hand, but the system works. And you have a film like Zero Dark Thirty, which shows the brutality of the rendition process and the torture process, but the information gained is always done about against guilty people. And we know they're guilty because they give accurate information that leads to terrorist plots being stopped and ultimately Osama bin Laden being captured. But this film is going so much further, the Mauritanian, in showing that the very structures right the way up the chain and right down to the bottom are rotten rotten on the level of a humanitarian disaster of mm -hmm. torturing innocent people but also rotten in terms of not functional for a security purpose in terms of getting intelligence they do the opposite of that so i've never and i wonder what i know the reception is small i just checked the figures and zero dark 30 took in tens of millions on its first weekend and over a hundred million in the the following weeks, whereas the Mauritanian, I think, has brought in a few hundred thousand on its opening weekend and about three million in total. So it's a tiny film compared to the impact of a massive blockbuster. But it does signify like something quite unique, I think, in terms of a shift in in cinematic perceptions of the US military. Do, do you agree or do you think other films like Born on the Fourth of July or something were, were equally critical or can you think no, of equally I, critical? I would I would say that there was another film recently to this uh, that was critical of the CIA, but on the on the judicial level, and that was the the program um, that starred um, I want to say Adam Driver. He actually played the part of Daniel Jones, who uh, was part of the subcommittee to investigate the torture methods of the CIA on detainees. And it it just like the Mauritanian, it was very uh, underwhelming in terms of viewership. But it was such an important film. It shows that film is is like a pre. It's um, almost the after effect of the Mauritanian, and it showed on a much more broader scale the torture um, and the brutality and the hidden secrecy of the of the program at first. Um, and it's an important film. Again, you wouldn't know it because they don't promote that film much. But you're right in terms of there's a slow progression of getting uh, people to say, "Hey, wait a minute." Uh, the CIA does engage in brutal acts and the White House is willing to cover it up or become part of it. Um, maybe, hey, maybe they'll talk about the Patriot Act one day in these films, right? And to such a, an extent, or maybe they'll become highly critical of the Bush White House, which is next. We, one can only hope. But at the same time, yes, it, at, le at the very least, we're starting to bring attention to it in the form of entertainment, in, term, in, for, in, for, in form of film. I would like to see a bigger audience, just like Zero Dark Thirty, but I, I'll take what we have for now, at the, at the very least. The only good thing about the Mauritanian, also at the same time, was that he wrote a book about it. And yeah. I'm surprised they, they allowed him to write the diaries. And of course, which was in the film for a short bit, what I didn't realize was that- Do you he know he's actually four, written four books? Yeah, I was just going to say, he's written four books, but he's not yeah. allowed to go back and get them. No, nope, they won't give it to one. One is about yeah, finding yeah. hope in, in despair. In right, dark yeah. places, but he, that, that yes. was so, yeah, yeah, I'm terrible. Surprised. Because right, he actually was it? kept. He won his um, appeal, didn't he? Because the the prosecution lawyer would would not go ahead because he realised he had no. It was all based mm. on confession extracted through torture, and Ramzi Youssef's indictment of it was was based on torture. So the prosecution going to go ahead, but he was essentially released, but then detained for another seven years during the Obama yes. administration as they as they appealed it. Yes, that's right. 
Um, and now, he, now he's back in Mauritania, but the, the US government has not returned his, um, his passport, so he can't leave the country for medical treatment or to see his family. Right, he's also married, too. At the, at the end of the film actually you know, uh, shows that, too. Um, yeah. What happened was with, with Barack Obama, when he came into office, he tried to repeat his commitment to close Guantanamo, which was you know, basically just a, a thinly veiled threat. It never really happened. Uh, but and in 2010, the um, Guantanamo Task Force Review Report recommended Slahi be considered for prosecution in a military commission. Uh, and the task force recommended Slahi was too dangerous to be released. And so there was another drag out of the courts itself. And that's why, you know, at the end, he gets excited. He hears about the news that they won his petition to be released. And then Obama, who's just basically carrying out the, the, the Bush policies of the Middle East itself, just an extension. Um, so much for hope and change there. But yeah, he unfortunately spent another seven years, which must have been, uh, you know, uh, just a complete mental destruction of, of Sly himself, because here he is, he's thinking he's getting released and he spends another seven years because he, yeah. he, he spends, he, remember, he's, but when he gets the, the court order to be released, He's already there seven years. Mm. So he spends another He thinks it's the end. Years. It's a halfway point. Right. False, false endings like that are psychologically devastating. <laughs> yeah. Which is even worse than the torture itself. Right, exactly right. He must have been... I would have been destroyed by it. But to, this goes to show you, even after 14 years of this, he comes out, and the first thing he does is forgive his tormentors mm. um, in the film. And that just... What does that tell you right there? You know, here's a guy who basically is kidnapped from his own country, told that he's part of the worst, you know, terrorist attacks in the United States. He's responsible for the deaths of 3,000 people. He's tortured brutally for years, the first three years of his captivity every single day. And then for the next 11, he's held in isolation away from people. And he's told he's going to be released. Then he's not. And then, he, and then he's released and he's captured. And then he, he tells he forgives his captors. Meanwhile, at the other end of that spectrum, you have the CIA, the State Department, the White House, the military, who are all basically torturing this guy using speculation at this time to try and convict him. And they don't care how they convict him. And that's what made the prosecution basically quit because he saw what happened. He saw that he was tortured. He couldn't use the confessions made under duress. And he said he couldn't convict. And then they called him, I think in the film, they basically, I didn't know this, the one, his superior basically said he was a traitor. Mm. Um, and I wonder if that was true. I, I wouldn't deny it anyway. But yeah, he basically left and um, I think he did the right thing. How could he, in his good conscience, basically try and convict somebody based on information that came out of duress? And that's just not sly. That's from Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, Ramzi bin al-Sheib, Mustafa al hassan all the other, you know, the main five which is the, the last trial of all, that are basically the manpower of Al-Qaeda, the hierarchy of Al-Qaeda, who are basically alleged to have part of 9-11. And look, if the evidence was that overwhelming with Khalid Sheikh Mohammed or Ramzi bin al-Sheib or Abdul Aziz Ali, right? If the evidence was overwhelming, they wouldn't need to torture them anyway. You know, later on, FBI agent from New York, Ali Soufan, he basically says that they didn't need to, to torture these people for information because the information that they gave wasn't new information. Yeah, they already and, had well, information. Ali Safan was well. interrogating Abu Zubaydah. That's right. And then the CIA stepped in and tortured him. Well, what's interesting is even when the CIA interrogated, said, "Well, we think we've got everything from him now. He's not giving us anything new." They got instructions from Washington to just carry right. on, and they carried on for days and days more, just waterboarding him, and he wasn't able to give any new information. Or Khalid Sheikh Mohammed gave completely spurious information about a, a cell of black Al Qaeda recruits in Detroit, which was completely fictitious and <laughs> completely fabricated. Right. He just wanted to say something, anything, so he made something up about black Al Qaeda recruits. But the defense of the torture program is still there; it never dies down. Where after the underwear bomber, I think that was twenty ten, the underwear bomber, Liz Cheney. Dick Cheney's daughter goes on television saying this guy should be waterboarded. Dick Cheney said he should be waterboarded to, to extract information. There's no admission that this doesn't work. And it actually puts people's lives 
in danger, never mind morally wrong. They just keep pushing and pushing the narrative that anyone who is opposed to this kind of thing is endangering national security. And and then what I find interesting as well, you know, that Sasha Baron Cohen um, comedy show he did about America a couple of years ago. Yes. I forget I forget what it was called now, but one of the characters he had was an Israeli general right. who did a lot of funny stuff, but got an interview with Dick Cheney. He got one of Sarah Palin and he got one of Dick Cheney. I think they were the, like the biggest two names on it. And he got Dick Cheney to sign a water port. Now, I can believe that Sacha Baron Cohen tricked Sarah Palin, right, and got her to fly across the country for this thing. And I can believe he tricked everyone else on there. I don't believe he tricked Dick Cheney. I don't believe that Dick Cheney, who, who has Secret Service protection for life, <laughs> got fooled by a fake Israeli general into doing an interview. Someone who doesn't, you know, how, how many sit down conversations like that does Dick Cheney do? Could you get an interview of Dick Cheney if you want? <laughs> you know? uh, I, so yeah, it I seems could. like Dick Cheney was up for doing this and up for signing a waterboard as if he's being having the piss taken out of him, but not really. He's quite proud of it and he's proud enough to do that. I, I always said that um, with Cheney, I think he wanted to do that. Uh, you couldn't get an interview with Dick Cheney unless they do scrutinizing background uh, search on the person, you know, doing conducting interview. All they could have done was just a background search of this guy, found out he used a fictitious name too. It wasn't, uh, it was some like ridiculous outfit he was wearing. And I, you know, I don't believe for a second that he was tricked that badly. Um, no, people were trying to explain it away saying that, oh, well, Dick Cheney, I saw more report. Dick Cheney has never killed anyone himself right and right. he wants to be close to someone that has so that's what the interview that's why he was interested in this israeli special ops guy you know but it's just ridiculous <laughs> it's, it, it, it's almost like it's almost similar to the the storyline that the u.s government gave it in the 9-11 commission that muhammad atta mawana shayi traveled to afghanistan on the the alleged the uh influence of slahi and you, let's come back to that in a minute. Let, yeah. let me come back. Yeah. Let's just talk about the the torture thing for another minute, and then sure. we'll come back to. I want to get. I really want to ask you about that and the hole it leaves in the commission report. But before that, I want to ask you, what do you think this attachment is to torture? Because in in subsequent interviews, the deputy director of the CIA at the time, plus a CIA lawyer, is justifying the torture program and also saying, "Well, we you know we had to think on our feet. We didn't know what to do, so we brought in these psychologists, and they said this." And that disguises the fact the CIA has a history of running torture programs and studies on torture and enhanced interrogation going back to the 1950s with MK Ultra. And what comes out of that is rolled out as the Phoenix program in Vietnam of the rendition, torture and assassination of Vietnamese citizens using psychologically based interrogation techniques. And that's then rolled out again throughout Latin America in the 80s, teaching the militaries of the Honduran and uh, Ecuadorian militaries, these kind of enhanced interrogation tactics and things they psychologically discovered along with the British of when people inflict pain upon themselves, that has a, a more deleterious psychological effect than somebody else doing it. So if you're, if you're in a stress position for some reason, that's more damaging to your sense of well-being than being punched and kicked or sensory deprivation, the black bags over the head, that goes back to what they discovered, CIA psychologists discovered in the 1950s. So this wasn't some like new thing that the CIA suddenly discovered torture in 2001, which is kind of the way they present it. But they also knew that this stuff wasn't effective, right? It's not, unless you have a new batch of agents, I don't, I don't know how well wisdom from one generation in the CIA is communicated to the next. So unless you have mm. a batch of people in there at the time who really have no idea what was going on in the 1980s or no idea what was going on under the Phoenix program. So I don't, I don't know, right? But it, it just seems it's really hard to believe they didn't know the limitations and a lack of effectiveness of torture because it's, like, it's not like that wasn't completely well known at the time. Going back to World War II, there were British... Um, a Jewish guy who was interrogating Nazis during World War II for the British and saying that we, we would have used torture if it was effective, but what's effective is bringing them cups of tea and just keeping talking and talking and talking and eventually they'll exhaust and you build rapport and then you get information that way. As soon as you torture someone, you cut all rapport and there are people who can just resist that. Or there are people who will break and tell you anything and everything under the sun. So what, what do you think the, um, the interest is in torture and maintaining this then? I, I've always said that the CIA should have known better than to have used torture to try and get a confession. Now, the greatest example of this is the capture of Abu Zubaydah. And it was basically with his capture that Ali Soufan 
basically interviewed Abu Zubaydah, and he didn't use torture. What he did was, I think he brought him a hamburger, and he also called him by his nickname that his mother used. And that's what opened him up. And he showed him a bunch of photographs. And when he showed him a bunch of photographs, he was naming names. And they just showed him a photograph of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. And they said, who, you know, do you know who this is? And they, they, they basically did this by accident. They, they didn't know they had the photograph of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. And that's when Abu Zubaydah said, Mukhtar. How do you know Mukhtar was behind 9-11? And Sufan feigned ignorance and said, um, we know everything that you knew that you know. We're just trying to test you. Sufan at that time didn't know who Khalid Sheikh Mohammed was. Only Frank Pellegrino from New York did. Um, but what it tried, what it did was open up Zubaydah right away. And he opened up to Sufan. Here's a fellow Arab. He knows about his family, um, much about his background. And so he was very kind to him. And by doing that, you get a, a trust level um, with your with the suspect. And so you get him to open up more. Same thing happened in 1996 during the Bajinka plot when the Philippines captured Abdul Hakim Murad, um, who was an associate of Ramzi Youssef, um, and him, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and Ramzi Youssef were um, a part of Bajinka plot, which was the international plot to bomb 12 planes over the Pacific. When they captured him, they beat him at first. And that stopped because the lead investigator Rodolfo Mendoza came in and gave him a hamburger. And that opened him up for the next couple of days. And all because of one simple kindness that got him to open up. And he talked about the whole plot and who was involved in it. The CIA should have followed suit because when um, the CIA found out, this was from George Tennant, Tennant found out Ali Sufan and the FBI were interviewing Zubeda. Tennant went to Bush and said that we need to be in charge of the program. I don't know why, maybe it was interagency fighting or not, but if he's getting information from him, um, what does it matter? But the CIA wanted to be in charge. And when they got in charge, Bush signed off on it. Immediately, they took Zabeda and they brought him into, I want to say, they brought him into um, Pakistan and they put him in a coffin. And because he was known to be scared of bugs, they put him in a coffin, sealed coffin with bugs in it, beetles and spiders and whatnot, for 24 hours. Does that make sense? It shut down Zubeda for a long time, and they tortured him enough times to where he confessed to everything, and most everything that he, he was involved in turned out to be false. Well, I'll put it to you, Adam. You say, does that make sense? Well, you could say... Yes, it does, depending on what you want the outcome to be. So Abu Zubaydah, when Ali Zafon was interrogating him, was singing songs about the Saudis. Now, they, they actually played a trick on him, didn't they? Where they led him to believe he was in Saudi Arabia, oh, because yes. that would scare anyone, right? Yes. So, But it didn't scare him. He said, oh, thank goodness, give my number to this, call this number. It's this Saudi member of the royal family, and he'll sort it out. And he, he gave about three names of prominent Saudis who were aware of the 9-11 plots. So that's not the kind of thing you want uh, people like him to be saying. After the CIA get their hands on him, suddenly it's not Saudi Arabia anymore, Iraq. Iraq is now connected to 9-11. Saddam Hussein's behind it. That's much better, right? So, so is it a case of wanting to get him to say the right thing? If you're the CIA, yes, because that's what you wanted. And but what, what's that? it goes back to your point about the CIA. What was the reason for the torture methods? Was it basically to force them to say what they wanted to hear? Well, that was the case with Ag Ibn al-Libi, Sheikh Ibn al-Libi, when they tortured him, the alleged uh, militant, um, I want to say from Jordan. They tortured him, and they tortured him to the point where he, want he wanted them to say what they wanted to hear, was that, yes, al-Qaeda was seen with uh, Baptist officials in Iraq, um, talking about and, make and, and um, making chemical weapons. Later, after they go back and the Senate committee actually sends representatives to interview him, why did you lie? He told them. I told them anything they wanted to hear just so they stopped torturing him. So that segues nicely into the final question I'd like to raise with you. Specifically, Salahi plays a small but important role in the 9-11 plot in that he gets, I think it's Mohammed Atta. Mohammed Atta 
and Ramzi bin Arshbib to go to Afghanistan to train. Yes. And he meets someone, I think he, meet, he meets someone on a train, doesn't he? Yeah, oh, yeah, that's a, it's, it, one story. One, one story was a train, the other one was a uh, room in, um, I want to say, uh, Dusseldorf. So, don't okay, me on so just, just let me place the question then and, and you can roll on it. So we have stuff that's clearly nonsense coming from hijacks about the connection to Iraq, okay? And then we have um, now these holes appearing. So in the specific instance of Salahi, if that's incorrect, how big a hole does that leave in the commission report? Is it a, a minor detail or an important thing? And then that leads on to the larger question. We zoom out and say, well, if we accept that a lot of the testimony from people like Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, Abu Zubaydah, Ramzi bin Al Shabib was coerced and therefore not of much value, how big are all those holes together in what we know about 9-11 and how the plot was constructed? Like, what does that remove that we can't really say much about with any certainty? And because I think that um, Abu Zubaydah was significantly downgraded in his level of importance, right? It's now believed only he was never that much of a central Al-Qaeda figure, which is not consistent with the kind of stuff he was saying to Ali Sufan, the kind of information mm -hmm. Ali Sufan was getting out of him. So if you take that all in conjunction, how big are the holes left by the potential um, that torture has really rubbished all the all the, invest all the interrogations? Just just to add on Zubeda too, he's also the only prisoner in Guantanamo currently that's held without charge. Uh, CIA actually says that they found out he's not a number three man and he wasn't important at all. And he had no important information. But um, I, I, how is that consistent with the fact that he gave up Khalid Sheikh Mohammed? It's also not, I'll tell you what it's not consistent with. The uh, testimony of Eamon Dean, the British operative ah, who, yes, who, yes. Al -Qaeda, who said I was, I was, was a central guy there. Right. It, I, I, yeah, there's a disconnect here. Because according to Zubeda, he's actually a recruiter in um, Al Farouk camp. Um, but they found out that he wasn't. He was basically just a, um, a nobody who was at a camp who basically ran it to certain people that were affiliated with certain terrorist plots. He's also said to have met uh, Zacharias Moussaoui as well. Um, so there's a lot of connections. Here. Um, but yes, I, there's something, you know, unconscionably wrong regarding his testimony with the FBI and his testimony with the CIA. If the CIA is claiming that he has no real connection, um, what does that say about his testimony with the FBI? Because at least with the FBI, he told him some sensitive subjects that very few people in the world would know. Going back to the most important issue of all, and this is an issue you raised, and I think this is the biggest issue of all. There is not just a hole, I, this is a huge hole in the 9-11 Commission story, because this is the connection between the Hamburg cell and the 9-11 terrorist plot. To me, it is unconscionable that this is absent in the 9-11 Truth Movement, because here it is, the connection between Muhammad Atta, Marwan al Sheikh and Ziyad Jarrah, not muscle hijackers, but the pilots, and Ramzi bin al Sheikh, the coordinator, the alleged coordinator, to, from going to Chechnya, because that was the story, they were going to Chechnya to fight against um, the government there. And it was Mohammed al Slai, according to the government's contention, who persuaded them to not fight in Chechnya, but to go to Afghanistan and fight or become part of the planes operation. And I was going to say something about this earlier, that Mohammed Atta, Mawan al Shay, is Ziyad Jara, under the alleged influence of Slai, which we now know is false goes and not just meets with the lower levels of al-Qaeda, but meets with Muhammad Atef, the military commander, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, and Ayman al-Swahadi, and later Osama bin Laden, the top echelons of al-Qaeda, the most wanted men in the world, even at that time. Um, unconscionable to think that the, you know, these young German students who have um, little to nothing uh, regarding any type of terrorist activity before suddenly meet with the hierarchy of Al-Qaeda, which really begs the belief that um, the security measures regarding Al-Qaeda are indeed lacking. But now, without that connection, how did they get there? 
How did Muhammad Atta, Mawana Shay, Zia Jarrah meet with these officials if Slahi is not the connection? So how is this not a big part of the truth movement? Begs the belief. Well, okay, so I mean it is just to comment on that. It is funny that Al Qaeda is completely uninfiltratable by any intelligence agency in mm. the world. And yet mm. <laughs> you have all these people who just get involved and five minutes later they meet the boss. Um, and that's that's an eternal puzzle to me. Stunning. But surely the way you're going to find this out, how, how did those four guys, the three pilots and um, Ramzi bin al-Shabib, get connected to Al-Qaeda? You're going to find out from Ramzi bin al-Shabib because the other three, they're goners. So in all the um, test, in all, all the interrogations of Ramzi bin al-Shabib, is that the only narrative you came out with, that Salahi connected them? Because surely... However that happened, he wouldn't have been able to keep his lips closed about it through years of interrogation. So, because we know that the hijackers did end up in Afghanistan. There's video of them there, yes. conclusively, right? But that's a, that's a real puzzle then to me. How how do, if the connection that Ramzi bin al-Shabib presented isn't true, then what is the truth there? And why was why were the CIA not able to attain that from al-Shabib? Isn't that a great question? I think that's a fantastic question. How did Muhammad Atta, Ziyad Jarrah, Mohan al get to Afghanistan? That's the eternal question. That's probably the most underrated question of all, because we don't know. And according to bin al Sheib's testimony, now take this as a grain of salt, because he's tortured by at this time, it's Slahi who makes that connection. But remember, now Slahi, Slahi's conv- he's not convicted of anything. All the things that he basically... Um, uh, admitted to, came under duress, and was basically thrown out of court. So, all right, he's, he's gone now. He's off the picture. Now, if we're to believe Ramzi bin al sheib then that means a part of Ramzi bin al sheib is also false. What else is false? That's the next question. What else is false from bin al sheib Because I think there's some truth to what he said. Just like I think with Khalid Sheikh Mohammed too, and he's the biggest one of all. There is... Remember, he's tortured the most. I think he was tortured 170. He was waterboarded 173 times in a single month. All right. So he basically, CNN is the only site that I know, what media outlet that I know that uh, posted all the things that he basically admitted to. It was like 71 crimes. I was like, oh my God, there's no way he was involved in all these things. No way. He basically just said whatever they wanted to hear. Right. I think he was involved with some of them. Now, I'm not saying he's an innocent guy. I think he, he was behind the murder of Daniel Pearl at the very least. Anyway, but to, for him to be a mountain that many, he had to have been in Saudi Arabia, Qatar, the, you know, all over the place. I mean, just all over. So what do we know? What is true and what is not? Well, we don't know. And the only reason why we can't know right now is because the trial hasn't started. And so that's why the lawyers for these people are begging for the trial to commence because they're about to go before the court and say, hey, listen, my, my client basically said these things under duress and he can't use them in a court of law. When I interviewed Ken Williams of the FBI in Phoenix, the Phoenix memo, he basically said near the end of the, of the uh, interview, I asked him about Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. He basically says that he thinks, because he went to Guantanamo, and he basically thinks that in the future, before the trial even starts, which is next year, allegedly, um, that they're going to offer Khalid Sheikh Mohammed a deal. And what they're going to do is they're going to make a deal with him, suggesting that he, he involve himself in the 9-11 plot, and they'll take the death penalty off the table for all of them. He thinks that the, he's going to take the deal and basically just admit to 9-11. By doing this, this is the most important part, by doing this, all the information that the prosecution allegedly has now goes in the National Archives. So we'll never know, unless it's 40, 50 years down the road, what they have, and most importantly, what they didn't have. This is the most important issue. What you want and I want is basically for the trial to happen. Because what I think is going to happen, if the trial does start, is that all the evidence that they have basically came under the duress of torture. And if that's the case, all these guys walk because 
everything that they admit to, even if they were a part of it, can't be used in the court of law, just like what they did to Slahi. I think that's basically what's going to happen. Unfortunately, I have to agree with Ken Williams. They're going to make a deal with them, and they're just basically going to let them live out their lives in Guantanamo for the rest of their lives. And whatever documentation the prosecution has will be locked in the National Archives for the next 40, 50 years. And 9-11 will die. It will die a very unceremonious death. Okay. Thank you very much, Adam. That's all been great. And I'll speak to you again soon. Oh, thank you very much, Richard. A pleasure.